Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello, team. Welcome to Scream Something, Volume 17. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey everybody, in Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns that we have planned after the season finale. Forager will bring new gods to the cell. He will? Forager will not, but Forager will. No, this isn't going to get confusing at all. Come! And with that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are Leviathan Wakes and Beyond the Grip of the Gods. The release dates were April 7th and April 14th of 2022. The in-episode dates were June 6th, July 3rd, and August 24th. The directors were Vinton Hoik and Christina Soda. And the writers were Kari Payton and Taneka Stotts. Both new to Young Justice. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 17 begins with King Orin and Miss Martian questioning Ocean Master. While DNA evidence proves he's a clone of Orm, he still insists that he's not. And despite their best efforts, Ocean Master refuses to allow Miss Martian into his mind to determine the truth. Citizens across Atlantis are still calling for Arian to be crowned the true king of Atlantis, adding to the civil and political unrest between Atlantis's leaders. Meanwhile, deep in the ocean, Calder, Wind, Delphis, and Lagan are hard at work dodging danger and searching for Arian's crown. And Wind continues to be very, very worried about Calder's mental health, as we all are. Please take a break. Calder and his team eventually discover the ruins of Atlantis's original capital city, including what viewers would recognize as the bones of Arian from his death in earlier flashback episodes, before their collective magical powers lead them to the lost crown of prophecy. But their discovery is interrupted by the arrival of a giant leviathan creature thing. <laughs> In Poseidonus, Ocean Master finally agrees to let Miss Martian help him, and her psychic guidance reveals that he was a clone created by Vandal Savage and Ultra Humanite and brainwashed by Simon, and that Arian that we have been dealing with for the last couple episodes is actually also a clone of the original Arian, but with the mind of the original Orm, because one clone wasn't confusing enough in this situation we'll get to that meanwhile in zebel another conference of delegates commences to decide on a plan of action and to vote for the one true king while mira stands by orin the other delegates rally around a reluctant arian saying that his coronation is the only thing that will bring peace to the public on the verge of rebellion and a near unanimous vote elects arian who is actually the real orm as high king meanwhile in the ruins of atlantis uh, Calder and his team fight the Leviathan and use it to break through the ground and escape the undersea. When they finally make it back to Zebel, Arian is addressing the people of Atlantis, and while Miss Martian informs Orin of her discovery, the information is seemingly too late to be of any use. Arian takes the crown, but when he places it on his head, the Lords of Order strike him down and drain the crown of its magic, killing the clone. Queen Mira steps up to denounce the false king and rally the people around her husband. But Orin refuses the crown and insists that Mira is the prophesied true king of Atlantis, an honor which she accepts despite her reservations. And the people rally around her. <clears throat> Afterward, Orin announces that he'll be rejoining the Justice League along with Lagan, and Calder announces he'll be taking a leave of absence for his mental health. Dr. Fate briefly confronts Vandal Savage on the war world and in Atlantis, the clone of Ocean Master is released from prison to live his own life. And everything seems pretty neatly wrapped up, except that somewhere out in space, Superboy's having an existential crisis still and sees the magic school bus from the previous arc and is now having a vision of Lex Luthor. I'm sure all that is fine. Totally fine. No worries. <laughs> no worries at all. So we all take a breath at the conclusion of that arc. 
And the next arc begins over a month later in Dakota City, where Rocket struggles to get her young son out of the house and over to his father's apartment. And we find out after the credits that the reason she's going to be away for a while is that she's traveling with Forager and Jay Garrick to New Genesis to represent the Justice League at a summit that also includes the New Gods and the Green Lantern Gore. While our heroes arrive in Supertown and meet with High Father, High Mother, and Orion, another bug, who we'll call Mountain Forager for now, uh, <laughs> infiltrates a secured warehouse and steals a radion powered ruction cell, which is apparently a dangerous and outdated piece of technology. Rocket and Orion attempt to pursue the thief, but fail to catch her as she escapes. But later, at a meeting between our heroes and some of the new gods, Forager figures out that they can probably find her in the mountain hive. Meanwhile, on Apocalypse, uh, a man attempts to inspire revolution in a bar, and when one woman expresses interest in his ideas, he takes her to meet the rest of the resistance, only to reveal that he's actually Makam, and he's working for Darkseid arresting traitors and rebels on behalf of him. (laughs) And apparently, Darkseid is pleased enough with Makam's progress that he's summoning him for a meeting. Oh, you know. We'll get back to that later. You know, as a dread lord does. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Ominously stand and do nothing. (laughs) Back on New Genesis, Mountain Forager presents the Ruction Cell to her hive to great rejoicing and entrusts it to two young larvae. To keep it safe while the rest of the hive meets with the new gods that are approaching their caves. While Rocket and Orion try to convince the elders of the mountain hive to return the ruction cell, (laughs) our forager explains the severity of the situation to mountain forager who agrees to help for the sake of her hive. Meanwhile, somewhere out in space, Connor is having an elaborate hallucination of being the new Superman protecting Metropolis and the rest of the world under the orders of Lex Luthor. But Lex insists that Phantom Girl is slowing Superboy down and and that he'll never reach his full potential unless he lets go of both her and Miss Martian. On Apocalypse, Darkseid instructs Macom and Mantis to faithfully follow the orders of the guy in the time sphere, who turns out to be... Lore Zod. More more later, as you as you can expect. And back <laughs> to New Genesis, our heroes are able to track down the larvae, but the ruction cell has already reached a critical point, and when it blasts Orion, he enters a violent rage, lashing out at everyone present. Soon after, the ruction cell expels the last of its energy, and Mother Box is able to calm Orion. The now dormant ruction cell is entrusted to Metron, who I trust none at all, who takes it to his (laughs) vault, and Rocket worries about her ability to lead negotiations tomorrow. And far out in space, Superboy's conversation with an imaginary Lex Luthor is interrupted by a mysterious man who introduces himself as Drew Zod, and explains that Superboy's suffering from zone sickness, and that he can teach Connor how to survive in the Phantom Zone. We can finally call it the Phantom Zone. Yay! I say there is many much Aster. Yeah, let's get into that. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. So starting off with one of the bigger picture things here, we're starting off with the Calder episode, because this is one of our episodes where we're covering the end of one arc and the beginning of the other, uh, which is fine. <laughs> we'll make it work. <laughs> But it's very cool to see Kari Payton writing an episode. This is, I think this is like his first writing credit yeah. for television. Yeah, which I I found so odd. And we talked to, about it a little bit on the Discord. Um, it's just interesting that this is it. And it was never at any point on The Walking Dead. I just found that like super intriguing to me that it had never, never come up before. But it's awesome that it's here. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really cool, especially when it's one so focused on this character that he's been playing for so long. And it's a it's a good episode. It's a good episode with some real good moments in it that I was like, this is his first TV writing credit. This is good. Yeah, I just thought it was cool. Shout out to Kari Payton. Like, always shout out to everyone who writes on this show because all of the writing is very good. I know our the other episode. Uh, that we're covering today was also written by someone who was new to Young Justice. But like when it's someone who's like 
who has done a whole other career that is not writing and then is coming in and has their first writing credit on something that's been running for so many years and has such an established style to be like, wow, great job. Great job all around. Yeah. Just kudos and props. Uh, really liked it. Uh, other things, smaller things. I love any excuse to see uh, Miss Martian be a mermaid. We've talked about it before. It's lovely. I love that. <laughs> I love that Miss Martian went, I can shapeshift anytime I'm underwater. I'm just going to be a mermaid because, yep. you know, that's that's <laughs> why wouldn't you <laughs> that is that is the benign superpower power fantasy and i love it uh little th- other little thing in this episode that is very quick but clearly very purposeful and i like it and it's one of the writing things we get calder echoing the thing that batman says to him uh way back mm-hmm. in what a, a downtime when af- when batman calls calder out on like not not being focused as a leader and he's like either you're here 100 percent of the time or you need to walk away uh and calder throws the exact same thing at lagan who's just you know very worried about his wife which is valid uh <laughs> but i think it speaks to calder's like mental state during that episode that he is leaning very far into like how, how do be leader how do continue to be leader and he goes back to like the basics of like what did batman tell me when i was 16 uh 17 whichever it is in season one and i th- I feel like that's just interesting especially because by the end of this episode calder very thankfully takes a break but yes. well and that line also makes me think like because i saw some debate online of like the idea yeah. that oh no they could just easily get out after the, the leviathan fight but i think they could have always easily gotten out of the scenario yeah. i think like that initial cave-in kind of gave the misconception that they were somehow stuck but it's not that necessarily like they're just they don't know where they're going they're just trying to find this crown that's literally been lost to ten thousand, twelve thousand years worth of change and so it, it's interesting yeah. to reflect more on that line of like no you can leave any time or either you're with this mission or you go away like those are your options yeah and it's like, I don't think leaving would have been easy. No, but- uh, I think there would have been some struggle if Lagan was like, you know what? I am leaving. Uh, I feel like there would have been quite a bit of work to go into attempting to leave from under there. But like, I don't think it was impossible. It was just like, there is no, there's no easy way for us to get out. But if you want to get out, you could, but you shouldn't because we're on a mission for Aquaman. <laughs> I also, from a later, there's so much going on in this episode, and like some of it I don't even know how to comment on because I'm like, it's just cool. It's just cool, complicated everything, and I need to go back and watch all the episodes and put all the pieces together. But one of the things that I appreciated by the end of this, uh, because I know there had been much discussion among people of like, how's this prophecy going to play out? Who's going to be the thing? Whatever. And uh, the one true king being Mara works, I feel like, in the context of everything, but I really like. That even though she seems like the obvious answer, if you look at that prophecy and you're like, well, clearly it's not the guy who just got killed by the Lords of Order. And it's not the other guy who used to be a supervillain, but is actually just a clone and kept losing. Uh, I guess it's the third one who was present. But I like that there's an acknowledgement that from Orin, at least, of like, it's not just because the prophecy said so. He's like, no, you're just. You have proven leadership skills and an upbringing in this system of government that means that you understand it better than a lot of people. And you just you just seem like you'd be good at leading a people. I'm like, yeah, no, those are all better answers than prophecy. But if you want to throw the prophecy in there, too, I guess. Yeah. Also, I really want to come up with a new term um, instead of like geopolitical, but like say like Oshia political um standpoint like it also aquatic political yeah aqua political no, i was the uh, aqua political standpoint it also like changes the dynamics with zebel because her dad isn't going to do the same thing now that she's the one true king like from virtually every perspective it just is a better fit and he's also like and i don't want to please take it away thank you <laughs> his throwaway line where he's like i was raised in a lighthouse i don't know what i'm doing I'm like, this went on for a long time. If that's how you felt. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. And it's it's nice in that moment of seeing everyone in that scene clearly has a reason to be like, 
no, we actually do. She's a she's a good king. We're gonna take her kind of thing. Like they don't all just go, yeah, prophecy. Like all of uh-huh. them, like especially like King Shark being like one of the ones who's more difficult about everything. Of like, I don't I don't want to follow anyone but me. Blah blah. He's like, nah, she's good. Yeah. I'm like, good. That'll like, work. Thanks. <laughs> On the other plot line going on in this episode i find it very funny that connor thinks the school bus is what means he's losing his mind when it's the only real thing that has interacted with connor with a little asterisk on that but uh it is the main definitely a real thing and it's very funny that that's the one where connor goes wow i'm losing my mind i'm like no connor the school bus is real couldn't explain it to you if i tried but it's the thing that's real yeah I need three pages of notes to explain this school bus being here to you, Connor, but I promise you that's the one that's real. Well, I wonder, well, and part of it, I also think of the things that are more real for him in the Phantom Zone appear differently than the bus because when he views oh, that's Sup- a good point. when he views Superman, it you know it doesn't have that faded yeah. tone. So he's just like, ah, there's a bus. I can't. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but the other thing is, he's also seen that bus before. Yeah. So like it doesn't even that's like good. it doesn't that's even fit. Point. It doesn't even fit the rules of when when um, Zod shows up and he's like, you don't know me and I don't know you. That means we're real. So he's like, when I've seen this bus. Of- when we get Connor back to Earth, and he's like, yeah, I had all these weird visions, like the school bus. And Zatanna's like, no, the school bus was the real one, actually. Yeah, no. I know that you slowly figured out what was and wasn't real, Connor, but like, I need you to know, school bus was real. <laughs> um, that's great. Uh, other thing, too, I forgot to write this down, but to acknowledge... Uh, something from my crash in the mode last week. I'm very, gl- <laughs> I'm very glad Lagan lived and lived to see his kid. Uh, because as oh, we yeah. all know, I was crashing in the mode. I was like, you don't give me a dramatic goodbye moment just so that you can kill the fish man. Please don't. Uh, and not only does he not die, even though I was worried because he almost did a couple of times. Ooh. Jumping directly into danger, letting a crab almost kill you other problems um but he made it through yeah which like i said you know you had all of these like really good development moments even talking you know i see i see the note so we can bring it up even saying like i was super petty i was immature i was jealous for no reason and even in the moment of like even further character growth to say you're right I've been so focused on myself, I wasn't thinking about how impactful the death of Superboy would be on Calder, on McGann, like in thinking thinking of those things. Also, I'm going to jump inside this crab now. So <laughs> growth and still very much the same person in some ways. Yeah, but like the doing the wild, uh, chaotic choice in battle, but doing it as a way of knowing this is an extremely dangerous thing, but it will help others. Not the, I'm doing an extremely dangerous thing because I don't care what anybody else thinks, but I'm doing this dangerous thing because it's the only thing that's going to save everybody else. And I am confident it will work. Like there's a, there's a, there is a growth in that mentality, even though it is technically in like the same, like, (laughs) like the same category kind of thing. But yeah, no, it's a really, There are some really nice emotional moments in this episode, just with Wind acknowledging everything that is going on with Calder and pointing all of that out and Lagan having us again. These episodes were like, hey, man, Lagan's had some growth. You're going to actually enjoy watching him. And I'm like, that's wonderful. I'm so glad. I'm so happy that he's gone through enough that I'm like, I care whether you get through this. This is good. Uh, And yeah, no, those moments that feel honest and and even having him acknowledge that, like, he's like, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. That's really true. Doesn't make me be like, how could you not have thought of Calder? I'm like, yeah, sometimes that happens. Sometimes you're just, you know, you're dealing with 10 million problems right now and that slipped your mind. But you're acknowledging that it did and you're trying to be, like, more empathetic and caring. And that's good. It's just good all around. And he lived to see his kids. So I'm happy for him. And sp- Speaking of growth, uh, I mean, we can't go without saying, uh, look at that sweet Calder beard. <laughs> also, also, the I, I did appreciate seeing part of the fandom 
feeling seen by Wynn's not so full beard of just like patchy growth and just being like, yes, I see me there. Um, there's just it's just interesting. It's great that it's great to have representation no matter what form it comes in. Um, <laughs> and also, well, well yeah, there's perhaps hindsight. an oversimplification yeah. of it because bad representation does exist. That's but true. But for this particular joke, I am glad that uh, the, those who may struggle with beards uh, felt seen. It was so good. By a, a small design choice for Wynn also we know and his that struggle. Calder keeps the beard via via the trailer. So, or well, I guess I could save that for. <laughs> but to get near the uh, near the end of this this particular episode, uh, Calder's credits monologue on this one is just seriously so good. The writing and the acting for that little one minute bit are just so good. And like the character implications behind Calder saying that the thing he's most proud of is also something he is now deeply guilty about because of what it has led to and the losses of his friends and all of this stuff and how he should not be carrying that on his shoulders because you can't do that to yourself, Calder, please. Uh is so much but like i i teared up watching it for the first time it was so it was so good i was not i was like wow this episode's good it's wrapped up really nicely and this is good 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 nice good nice episode and then the credit scene is like hey you didn't cry yet this morning <laughs> are you ready gotcha well and i also feel like and this is certainly headcanon there's nothing to speak to it um, that the monologue that he's having before that with those still images, I almost like I could see that being part of the conversation he's ha- oh, yeah. having with Black Canary while standing there. And then, um, you know, that conversation continues into the credits. Yeah, I like that idea of that that read of it as a framing for it. Yeah, no, I could definitely see that. So shall we move on to Beyond the Grip of the Gods? Or do you have more Atlantis notes? No, I so because you didn't bring it up, I do have a question just because it is because I like that you and I have di- very different perspectives on this. How did you feel about Arian's death? That scene. What about it from a story perspective nope. or from an Emily has mentioned more than once uh, that violence, <laughs> that cartoon violence sometimes make me go, "Ooh, no, that's the uh, one. This one was not was not that again. I my <laughs> my bar for this season is now the the magic Doctor Fate Zatanna arc, yes. where I'm like, if Ooh. anything goes more than that, I'm gonna lose my mind. Uh, in terms of just being like, how? Uh, and so everything gets compared to that in terms of how much it makes me go, nope. Uh, and this did not make me go, nope. Uh, nearly as much as like some of the stuff from things Child did. At least in part, because this was, again, fast. Uh, This is a rather quick moment of just layers of person uh, disintegrate via magic. Um, (laughs) Though I think like the closed captions on it, because when I rewatch these uh, for note taking, I put the closed captions on to make sure that I'm like catching dialogue bits and stuff every now and then and pausing to process things. Uh, I think on that death scene, like the closed caption said something like burning scream, <laughs> burning death screams or something like Whoa. that as their description. And I'm like, that's accurate. And also terrifying uh, <laughs> how we're describing this. Uh, but yeah, no, in terms of the level of how much that made me go, Nope, not as high as some other things this season and not, not mad about it because I get what they were trying to do there. Like that felt very purposeful in a way that I couldn't think of any other way to do it. Cause like there's uh, like every other way that my brain thinks you could frame a scene like that to make it less violent. Like if this was still on like on a TV, on a TV PG network kind of thing would be levels of like, Oh, he just, disappears or you cut away when he screams and then there's just a flash of light or something like that and i feel like all of those would have read more as like being transported rather than 
being smoked by the Lords of Order. <laughs> so this is one of those ones where I'm like, yeah, no, that's the only way that you can communicate that that's what just happened. Uh, and you did it quickly and it's fine. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, the, again, yeah, the, uh, as the I other, always say, it's always just a me and my level of whether or not I want to watch ultra violence in a cartoon, which is generally not so much, which is just me. It's not a it's not a good or bad thing. It's just a my personal uh, inclinations, my personal taste. Also, though, I did have like weird thoughts of like, wait, would they have allowed anyone to accept that power to place two lords of order in theory on earth at the same time because you already have dr fate like were they going to be okay with that i mean obviously it's not a question we need answered but it was just a uh, a quick thought i had um, weirdly enough i think it's a level of intention if that makes any sense like arian was taking the crown with the intention of arian orum whatever we're calling him that that being uh Arian's body Orem's mind was taking the crown with the intention of gaining whatever powers it had and using them for whatever it wanted uh whatever he and Vandal Savage wanted whereas part of me feels like if Mira had taken the crown not knowing all of the implications of the crown and what it could do the Lords of Order may have on some level just been like yeah, that's fine. Yeah, She's we're good. good. And she doesn't have the intention to use this power to do whatever she wants and take over the world. And thus, we might be okay with it. Because I don't think the crown works the same way as, like, the Doctor Fate yeah. helmet. Like, we got no implications throughout the series as of yet. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm missing something. That the that Arian's crown does some sort of like, and now uber magical persona go. Uh, oh, it feels and, like a different kind of power. Yes. And on topic now that, now that it is open, we can also say that in hindsight, Mira is wearing the crown in this mid season trailer. <laughs> but how would we know? Why would we know? But now we know. And that, now we know. Yeah, so that was super fun. Um, also, uh, Roger Craig Smith, hats off. Well done being the clone of a clone with the mind and like I, I like that moment where you can see Orm realize he is a clone. Like it just comes across really well. Of just like that anger into just like oh wait, oh, I think I'm a clone. And just like that, the, that emotional beat, I just think is it, done really well. Yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. It's a very, it's a cool little subplot. And now he'll go off and live his life, and we'll see yeah. if he shows up again. <laughs> Maybe he joins Bo under security too. Oh my god, <laughs> I hope so. Him and Clayface, <laughs> we're just adopting clones and people who don't want to be villains anymore. Yeah. And I love that Clayface can also appear as anyone else, as if they are a clone. <laughs> so technically, yeah. Well, okay. So, with that, now do we want to move on to I am Beyond ready. the Group of the Gods? Okay. Yep. Time to get into new, some new Genesis stuff. First, the more down-to-earth stuff, uh, I will say, I would love to hear more from Greg and Brandon, from any of the writers who work on this arc about what went into the consulting with professionals when it came to portraying Amistad's autism. Uh, Because Greg, I know, has on Twitter mentioned a little bit of, like, a lot of the stuff that they're handling this season, they talked to people. They talked to people whose job it is to make sure that representation on television is accurate and informative and helpful and real uh, because that's important, especially when you're writing about groups that you are not a part of. Uh, and so like, to me, a person with, without much experience with any of this, it felt v very visceral and honest and portraying both rockets struggle of clearly not really knowing exactly the best way to handle this whole situation because it's complicated and <laughs> she's a young woman with a young son and has had no experience before this clearly of the best way to do this as well as kind of honestly acknowledging Amistad's discomfort 
with the rest of the world without like belittling him. Like I didn't feel like I didn't feel any of that. I just felt empathy for this kid. I was like, yeah, no, everything you're saying. I'm like, yeah, if that's how you process and interpret the world, all of that sounds like it would be a real struggle kind of thing. Uh, And yeah, I would love to hear more of everything that went into that. I know they have done several articles and interviews and really interesting stuff talking about a lot of the different stuff this season. And I would love to read more about that. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. As someone that, you know, worked with professionally worked with students with disabilities for, for years, it is a very real and visceral portrayal. It's a lot. I mean, and so I think it's really well done. I also think that there, that is a lot for some people to take in during their viewing experience. Um, yeah, but I, I but I, I would that. easily say that it is um, a good pr- portrayal for this individual's circumstance, which I think that's the part of it that comes across so well, is that we are clearly seeing what it is like in the day of Rocket and Amistad. You know, in, in that the portrayal is not trying in any way to attempt to umbrella all the experiences, but it is just a real and well done experience for what she is going through with her son. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Because I know I've seen some portrayals that are trying to be a sort of universal umbrella, which is impossible for anything. Uh, You just can't do it because every person is an individual and everyone experiences their own life and struggles differently uh but yeah i hear you it definitely felt very much like an individual portrayal of an individual child and mother who are dealing with this in different ways and also the acknowledge i appreciated the acknowledgement later not even later in the episode just once she's talking with uh amistad's dad of kind of vaguely acknowledging that he doesn't have a like program in place like he is not he does he doesn't have I what I Googled what the thing was it's individual education program. Like there's stuff that he doesn't have in place yep. to kind of cope with things and showing that that is in some ways like the reason some of this may be hitting a lot of people really hard is like Amistad does not is not in a place where he has been given the like tools to navigate certain things. And Rocket also hasn't been given the tools to navigate everything yet, which is part of why it maybe feels a little rough. Like yeah. So yeah. So the IEP and and or a five hundred four plan. Basically, you you are setting it up, and, and this is the hesitancy of the parent is because potentially when you you choose to make those decisions, it like she, like she was implicating is then it permanently potentially sets up a stigma around the child where she's you know like she's mentioning the child is super smart and knows all these things but then you know the count the counterpoint is also brought up but to make him to help him be more successful we need to put these things in place so that so that Amistad has the best chance to be the most successful that he can be I look forward to seeing how everything plays out it's one of those things where I'm like I'm in my corner and I don't know everything. And I'm like, I just want to see how this plays out. I want to see where this goes from here kind of feeling. On a different note, to now lean into the new Genesis and the space stuff, I thought it was an interesting note that apparently the Javelin can get to new Genesis in two days. And my brain went, where is new Genesis? And how do you get to it in two days? It takes a month to get to Mars. Uh, at least in Bioship, it takes a month to get to Mars. But it took like two. Uh, so, but it, 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 still, it took like two days in the Javelin when Su- when Superman went. It was like a two day. Oh, yeah. travel time. That's fair. So the I, Javelin I, is I, much faster than Bioship. But again, but I felt the same way. Like, but if Mars is two days, how in the how how does this work? Does it just take a while to get up to speed, and then you're just going really fast? But then it takes a while to slow down. So like everything's kind of two days. I don't know. I just i i would like i would like a map of the DC universe solar system. Uh, is there a boom tube? Is there something special about New Genesis? Do they just let them? Do they have like a boom tube system for the javelin to get to New oh, Genesis I or something? So. Who knows? Space geography, man. Uh. <laughs> also, on that to- on, on that topic, <laughs> I love how stoked Jay is about the entire experience. 
<laughs> yeah, he's just happy to be here. Because, like, I, you know, I didn't think about it, but, like, like, of course he wasn't on the league because the league wasn't formed when he was being a superhero. Yeah. And so now he's on the league. And, like, I also think about, like, when he was a superhero, were they doing space travel? Probably not, or at least not to the extent that they do now. So then, like, the whole thing is just new and exciting for Jay. <laughs> Yeah, and it's very sweet. He's got a cute little, like, relationship with Forager. Like, he's just willing to run with it. Yeah. Uh, it's like, new planet? You lived in the forest? I want to show. You got to show me, buddy. Like, he's got. Yeah. <laughs> he's got cool. He's good vibes. Well, there's also, like, um, a single frame of, like, when um, Light Ray comes and, like, knocks on the ship window and zips away. And I can't tell if I'm just adding it in or if it just is like this singular frame. But like as Jay is turning to Rocket, it looks like there's just like an ear to ear smile of just <laughs> just like I'm so excited for this whole experience. Yeah. I'm here. And it's I, I know a lot of people have pointed it out, but there's also the kind of general implication that Jay joined the Justice League after his wife's death and like needing to find purpose and community again and stuff and i'm like that it's it's not outright said in the show but it feels very true to like how that would be handled in this show and i like it as a headcanon and a reading of that situation because it feels really true and seeing him just be like i'm in space today is a good day uh <laughs> kind of thing is very nice i like it 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 also does answer the second flash line yes because Two, he says, you know, um, Oren says there's four Green Lanterns. Four Green Lanterns, two, two Flashes. Two Flashes. Uh, I think they can handle two Aquamans. We still, I technically, I don't think we know the fourth Green Lantern. We don't. We don't know which one uh, is the fourth one on the team. They have not shown us. No. Uh, we do not know. Maybe we'll know by the end of this arc, since we are getting stuff with, uh, apparently, the Green Lantern Corps is arriving tomorrow for the negotiations. Uh Watching this episode, especially rewatching this episode, all of the new Genesis stuff, because it is so Jack Kirby and it is all of the bright colors and wild concepts and just full commitment to it, gave me the thought that I wrote down that just says everything about new Genesis and the new gods has the same level of sincere and earnest commitment to weird 1970 na 1970s names and concepts as like a My Little Pony cartoon. Like it had that level of people fully straight faced saying names that sound just weird Totally. I am the, the new god, the Orion, the dog of war. This is the high father. Welcome to Super Town. This is high mother Sup and high father. Look at their hair. <laughs> Welcome to Super Town was the one that got me because it is said so sincerely oh, yeah. and is said with the gravitas of saying like a high fantasy kingdom name, but it's it's Super Town. Uh, <laughs> and that is. It's one of those wonderful, weird comics things. Like, I, I'm i absolutely not knocking it. I know that Jack Kirby and New Genesis and the New Gods are some people's favorite thing in all of comics history. And you know what? I am very glad for you. And it's wonderful. It is just this wonderful, weird thing. And it's the thing that they've been doing with all the arcs this season, of all of them having a completely different tone. And oh, yeah vibe and everything and this one is just leaning very hard into the new genesis of it all and it's fun <laughs> it is very funny though of being like yes young justice sometimes serious very sincere uh doing very cool things about comics welcome to super town <laughs> <laughs> love it wonderful it, it genuinely made me feel like it is the same level of earnest um with like a tolkien book like this is Lothlorien, yeah. and I am Elrond. And you're just like, wait a minute. You just said, you said <laughs> yeah. you're, you're what now? And this is Super Town? All right. I'm yeah, in. it's the thing. I'm it's in. the thing of like, uh, we've given like stuff like Tolkien and high fantasy, we give a pass to sometimes on that weird naming stuff because we're like, well, it's fantasy and they're using completely yeah. made up words and whatever. And like sci fi and this kind of like sci fi fantasy, uh, of, like science fantasy kind of thing has like that level of mixing both wild fantasy concept names with n normal names uh into like the imaginative willingness to embrace all of the bright colors and weird technologies 
of like 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 the only things that are coming to mind are like the way that like 10 year olds come up with stuff with like no shame and no overthinking of just like this is super town it's full of all these people and they have all these different powers and they're all amazing and this guy's named light ray and this guy's is <laughs> ryan dog of war yeah. and these are his parents and he's but and they all wear cool suits and there's so all the all the crayons all at once uh and i'm like you know what that's wonderful. I like that there's space for stuff like that in comics, even if part of my brain is like, I'm never going to remember all these vocabulary words, but I'm going to run with it. I'm going to try my best. I'm like, it's a it's a what powered what cell? A what, oh, what? yeah. The, uh, oh, well, that's old technology. That's that's five, six thousand years old. And you're just like, you just. It's a box that shoots lightning and you're telling me that's the old stuff. Yeah. Fi- again, five or six thousand years old. <laughs> we, should, we should really find a recycle program then. Yeah, you, guys. Don't keep that. Recycling's important. You can't keep all of your old technology locked up in a warehouse. It's not good. Oh, yeah. And as Tec- an alternative, technology you, don't just, waste. you don't just give it to Metron and let him put it in the vault either. That's not great either. Um, all right. Okay. So to move away from just screaming about the concept of New Genesis, I will say I thought it was very funny that they included uh, like the joke with Jay Garrick, where he's like, how do you know she's a girl with the with Mountain Forager showing up on like the security footage cam? And I thought that was so funny because literally <laughs> the the second uh, that they that she showed up on screen, my brain went. Ah, yes, a girl bug. Like, just immediately interpret it. Like, <laughs> she is drawn exactly the oh, same yeah. as Forager. But for whatever reason, my brain went, she's purple and has, like, a little bit of winged eyeliner and, like, a higher chirp. So clearly, she looks like a girl. <laughs> Which, only to realize, like, 10 seconds later, I'm like, Forager has the exact same eyeliner. What am I talking about? Gender is a construct. But... <laughs> every... I was going to say, every J. Garrick joke was the best part of the episode for me because it was also just he comes up he's like oh forager will show us he will oh not this forager oh that's not going to be confusing <laughs> and he says it with the biggest smile on his yeah. face he's like yep that won't be confusing at all uh of just jay garrick has a level of i will run with anything yeah. that is good but yeah no i thought it that joke killed me because i was like me and forager were both like yeah she's a girl Clearly, yeah. like I don't know what the art, the art department and the one second of vocal chirping did, but my brain was like, "Girl, how could you not? How could you not tell?" I will say, I was thinking for a lot of this whole episode that there seemed to be a vibe of kind of setting up at least a at least a loose parallel between Amistad and Orion, uh, at least in Rocket's eyes, kind of in terms of like quote unquote socially unacceptable outbursts and like that resistance to changing plans that they show with Amistad and then kind of also show with Orion and stuff. And like I don't want to dive too much into that until I see how it plays out because I know I at least have some hesitation over comparing someone who is literally called uh, Orion the dog of war to a small child with autism uh until i see how the whole situation is handled on both sides and how this plays out i want i want all the pieces to the puzzle before i try to fit them together with certain topics on this show so i just want to put it out there that i feel i'm aware of and thinking about that aspect of this arc that seems to be being laid out how it will play out or be fully realized, we shall see. But just acknowledging it. Yep. Well, and I, I feel like that that has happened a little bit throughout, throughout because um, the parallel potential parallels. And again, we're neither of us are trying to equate one wholly to the other. We are we're simply yeah, mentioning of the course not. parallels, but the the parallel between Beast Boy and Calder and, and those sorts of things. But yes, uh, wholeheartedly agree. I'd li- I, I want to see how it all plays out before. Um, coming to any conclusions. On on a different side of this, I'm just calling out the irony of Macomb leading an attempted extremist uprising on Mars to overthrow the current caste system because of the way his people are treated, only to turn right around and side with Darkseid, who is literally oppressing like every person on his planet. 
is is wild. <laughs> it's yeah. why it's what like this episode was what like made made that click in my brain where I'm like, you walked into a bar and said all of the words that you say on Mars all the time, and then punished the one person who said that sounds a little interesting. Um, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's one of those things where I go, hmm, and go, this will probably play out somehow. I feel like I feel like any time that I go, huh. That's an interesting irony there. The show eventually turns around and goes, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to have somebody talk about it eventually. <laughs> well, and I also wonder about the character that they chose to be the person that, you know, basically Macomb tricks into it because that's the same person that yeah. was in the trailer. And, you know, obviously when the trailer dropped, everyone's just like, in the, there's a short scene in the trailer that, that is from this episode of when Macomb betrays them and it's become the parademon and then that person right next to them and it's in the trailer and everyone was like ah who is this character who is this character and then it was like a a, pat- a patron at a bar who he just like messes with and gets sent sent off into like whatever terrible place on apocalypse they are now so i wonder if they will recur or if it's just very funny that they were in the trailer and everyone was like who could they possibly be only to find out <laughs> someone to help macabre's arc <laughs> I hear you. that way of sometimes you're like what was put in the trailer to specifically mislead us mm-hmm. and what was put in the trailer because it will later be very important yes we'll see and i think it's funny that on young justice you can't put it past them that somebody will end up being important later like you had four lines who knows <laughs> Ste- stephanie brown was at that metahuman uh <laughs> like ship thing for one yep. line in that one episode only to become a superhero a whole season later who knows <laughs> so this episode also has the whole thing with superboy and lex luther and the, and zone sickness <laughs> but pointing out that the uh the vision of superboy in metropolis in the white suit and saving lois lane specifically and protecting metropolis is also a kind of different version of it, a different take on it is shown in issue six of the Tyne comics in fears in the campfire backstories two part mm-hmm. uh, issue of the Tyne comics. It's apparently like a reoccurring memory slash like vision fantasy kind of thing from Cadmus of like his true purpose in the tie-in comics, it's uh, Superman kind of like goes rogue and attacks the Daily Planet and stuff. And Superboy not only saves Lois Lane, but also like punches out Superman and is wearing the the white solar suit and all that stuff. So it was it was cool to see like another riff on that of me being like, wait, that's a that's a callback to the tie-in comics where that's a whole thing. Give that boy a hug. Oh yeah, and then that vocal change as well for like the the very Cadmus days style of just almost robotic of just regurgitating yeah. the stuff that was placed at that time. It's the no contractions, perfect grammar uh, is a little bit of it. It's the I am the Superboy. Uh, yes, it's the way that he talks in the first in the first couple of episodes before he gets out of Cadmus, and it's the being asked direct questions and having a rote memorized response to them. And I am very worried for Connor and I (laughs) am very worried for this boy, but I do appreciate that. He's still trying to hold on to some of it that Lex Luthor's like, let go, let go of her vague implication of both phantom girl and miss Martian. And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. But that's the one thing where he's like, I don't know about that, that I'm not sure of. And I'm like, good. Good. There's still there's still some Connor there. We can yep. we can save him. Get in that bus. Uh, <laughs> get in the bus. We're saving Con. Has no one talked to Zatanna yet? <laughs> it's been several months. We've done a couple things, right? Like if I'm remembering the timeline correctly, yeah. we are at least um at least a month and a half. I want to say out from. We are at least a month. I don't want to say a month and a half. By the end of this episode, yeah. we're like a month out from. Zatanna going, hey, I think I saw Superboy's ghost in space. Uh, and I'm like, it's been a, are we, are we making plans? 
Yeah. I know we're focusing on Rocket now, and I'm very happy we're focusing on Rocket, and we're giving her her own arc, which she has not gotten to have yet. She hasn't gotten that much screen time. It's cool that we're getting an interesting look into who she is as a character and how she does stuff. That's wonderful. Also, Zatanna, text the group chat. Yeah. <laughs> Please. And the other thing that, just one of the other couple of things from this, uh, I think it's interesting that on a rewatch, I kind of realized that we never get to actually see whether Rocket was going to release Orion in that final fight because uh, Light Ray tells her to and tells her a little bit of the situation is like he's claustrophobic. He's claustrophobic. And if you don't let him out, it could be even worse uh, for him and or us. But the ruction cell explodes and disrupts her concentration before she can actually make that decision. And I think it's just an interesting thing on a rewatch of realizing I was like, oh, I hadn't, I, I'm not sure it had sunk in the first time through of like, oh, you, you didn't make that decision. And what does that mean? And just that complicated thing Rocket is going through of trying to figure out how to feel about this person who has clearly has some stuff he's not talking about. And yeah. I want to know what's up with Orion. Because again, his name is Orion, the dog of war. And I'm just like, I have, did you pick that name? Did someone else give you that name? I have several questions and I am worried about you. Just if anyone introduced themselves to me as that, I'd be like, is everything okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. It's certainly the more interesting narrative choice to just have that decision made for her. And then she needs to, she's going to have to process that having been made for her at some point. Also, having no other real choice to her to put him in the bubble even knowing previously his discomfort with yeah. um, being in confined spaces anyways. But again, that like that's her power set. What, what else would you do at that moment? Yeah. And also she, with the river thing, she has, he gives no explanation and he doesn't say anything. He just says, let me out. And she goes underwater and he says, let me out. And she's like, okay. He doesn't say like, he does a, th- a lot of us do it in like situations like that of just responding to I need to get out of a situation, not I need to explain why I need to get out of a situation. Uh, it's a it's a response. It's a normal human response to things sometimes. But it leaves Rocket being like, I have no idea what just happened and I have no idea what to do in the future. Like she has no idea if that was a I cannot be underwater thing or a I cannot be in the bubble thing or what it might have been. Uh, and yeah, she reacts in the heat of battle to be like, this is my power set. Uh, there is only yep. so much I can do. Uh, <laughs> you, you already punched the small bug children and yep. I don't know what's next. So you're, just, you're going in the bubble. <laughs> and Mountain Forager calls out. She's like, really? You just <laughs> you just hit two small children. <laughs> what the heck, man? How <gasps> dare you? Uh, but yeah. So I have more thoughts ra- on that, but we'll we'll crash the mode on on my thoughts on that. <sighs> okay. Um, more That's Orion thought. More Orion thoughts. Okay, because again, as we touched before, I don't have a ton of comics lore, especially about hyper specific comics things like <laughs> all of the new gods. So I'm just like, those sure are some brightly colored space alien people, and I don't know what any of them do. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what any of their backstories are or what any of them are up to. Um, but my last couple of notes for this are I'm very glad we've got somebody stepping in to help Connor so that he's not just jumping from rocks and having a mental breakdown about it. Uh, uh, and I know there's something up with this man, though I don't know all of the details and that'll go in crashing the mode. I am sure. Uh, but it's nice that Connor's got somebody to talk to other than his dwindling mental state uh and calling it and the calling it zone sickness of having this level of like like he has sea madness like yeah <laughs> like it's literally the you have been isolated for so long that you are falling into uh just mental breakdown uh, meant thought patterns uh and hopefully we can slowly help you out of that and then get you back to Earth and get you some therapy about it and a hug and a nap and everything <laughs> else. It. Like, I'm just yeah, like, it, every, season season five, everybody gets a nap and a snack and a hug. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Well, yeah, nothing like yeah. existing in a place that seems to exist outside of both time and space. Um, and things are only real because you believe them. Yeah. You know? And that's yeah. that's that would be great fine. for your brain. It's fine. Totally fine. Yeah. Also, and to touch on the last thing, there is so much happening in that end credit scene for this episode of just kind of it's an end credit scene that sums up the entire thing people point out about how this show has 10 million characters uh, summed up in one one minute scene of just people looking at a <laughs> looking at a roster on a uh, hologram oh, yep. of just being like, oh, and those are all the people who aren't on any established team. Yeah. And that's so many. What? Yeah. Uh, my, my, and my favorite is that Jason Blood is there, but that he mentions possibly adding Etrigan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's good. I know a lot of people have talked about that one. It was just like, oh, oh, Clark doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I really liked the seeing the one that stood out to me was Ty. Uh, Kai and Asami are at like the center of the of that grid of just being like, oh, right. We haven't seen you. We haven't seen you or had you mentioned uh, in since season two when everybody skateboarded off into the sunset. Uh, and so it's nice of just being like, hey, they're still around. They look could you, still be called on for stuff. That's great. That's great. Um, that was a fun one. I would love to see them this season again. That would be great. I have more. I have, yes, I don't. It might be Crash in the Mode, so I'll, I'll yeah. save. We'll put, that, we'll put more of this in yeah. Crash in the Mode because there are some ones on there that made my brain go, "Huh." Some people don't know some things clearly. Uh, we'll get into that. So, any more notes before we move into Crash in the Mode? I don't think so. I think we. I think we got all of all of my notes. Well, I mean, other than the fact that there. are that there was a Zod reveal, and then there was a second Zod reveal. And yeah. Then I was just like, oh, okay. I did not see that. I did not see that coming. You were like, I thought we were only going to get one. <laughs> yes. But but no, there were two. And I'm sure we will touch a little bit more on that in Crash in the Mode, which I think it's time for. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crash in the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of this recording. So this Crash in the Mode is based on episodes 1 through 18 and the trailer, if we remember anything. So my here, I've got two, I got two Crash in the Mode things, and I'm sure you have more. But so there is a moment uh, in this in beyond the grip of the gods where a white Martian puts something on the ruction cell and then disappears before anyone can see them. And I know there was some discussion in our discord and I'm sure there's discussion elsewhere. Of like who was that? When was that? Why was that? Uh, and so my theory, my best guess is that it is Makam on a, like a little time travel mission that is later down the line is in his timeline for whatever dark side's plan is. Uh, and that we will later see everything that went down there from his perspective. And it will make sense as to when and where and why, uh, because there's like no indication earlier in the episode that he's being sent on that mission. And I feel like just, uh, just hoping that the audience will assume that something happened between uh, between Macom uh, arresting someone and him meeting with Darkseid of just assuming he was tasked with another mission and sent on that mission and completed that mission without us being told that any yeah. of that was happening feels like a lot to just hope your viewers assume and follow without any context. So t I'm assuming time travel for now. But which is wild that time travel is the thing that seems like it makes more sense here. Uh, but that's what happens with the show sometimes. But whatever it is, it feels like a moment that will be explained by the end of the season. And yeah. we will have context later. Yeah. And I see and I'm over here thinking it wasn't Macomb because of the line that they're saying right as it's happening. It's something to the okay. effect of like things don't appear as like aren't the way they appear. That, like that's the the general effect of the line. So we'll the line from the 
from who? From the larvae? When the larvae are talking to each other? Or? No, no, the larvae are, are starting to run because they're talking outside. And then it's showing the white Martian place that yeah, yeah, yeah. on the on the ruction cell as a line is happening that is basically saying things aren't aren't what they appear. Okay, I could believe that. So we'll see. Because I was at trying the same to time, do... you have a time yeah, sphere, I... so you can do whatever you want. Yeah, because I was trying. I was doing some like pausing and rewinding and stuff of trying to like what red markings is this white Martian uh-huh. wearing? Are they the same as Macom's kind of thing? And they're similar. They look kind of like because Macom has like the arm bracer kind of look and like pants. <laughs> but like all of the shots of the white Martian that's messing with the Ruction Cell and New Genesis are in camo mode, are in yep. like see through transparent and mode and partial and moving kind of quickly and like at weird angles. And I'm like, this was on purpose so that I couldn't do this easily, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, so it's just to mess with all of us trying to be like, is there definitive proof that this is my calm? But we'll see. It's one of the, it's one of those many things in this season where my brain goes, I'm not going to worry about that right now because there's so much other stuff going on that I need to worry about because I'm sure it'll get explained eventually. Uh, <laughs> that kind of feeling. But my other crash in the mode point is that I just want to point out, we talked about this last week, I think, but uh, we talked about this last time in slightly different terms. But I'm just going to point out that uh, General Zod says that he and Superboy and Phantom Girl are all real. Uh, And the only other person that we've seen in the Phantom Zone that has like the same color and effect uh, of like being kind of translucent and like color inverted in the Phantom Zone and all that is is Wally. Uh and you can tell me what that means. Uh cuz you know, I got a feeling. I got a feeling that that means that a certain a certain Wallace West is perhaps also real and stuck in the phantom zone. Um, Possibly. <laughs> he he sped so fast. He, he was disappeared so into fast. the phantom zone. And he's just been stuck there. And he's apparently relatively chill about it. Uh, he has processed. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Again, this is me making an assumption, but it is me making an assumption based on the visual clues we have been given up to this point of every hallucination that Superboy has, other than Wally, every other hallucination is full color and opaque. Everyone that he pictures talking to him it is drawn the way they usually would be drawn. And the only person that he sees that he does not see the way he usually would is Wally. Uh, and why he would do that, why he would just go, but Wally is transparent. The only other re- would be like, well, he thinks Wally's dead, so he's going to imagine him as a ghost. And like, I can, I guess... Now that I've said it, it's, it's got some credence to it, but I don't yeah. know. I just want to hold on to Wally is alive and we're going to save him on our weird trip to get Superboy back. Woo. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Just it would be good. It would be good and it would be dramatic and it would be interesting at this point in the story for him to come back, uh, considering where everyone else in his life is at right now. I want to see it. Uh, but yeah, Neil. What crashing the mode do you have? Well, let's all just be clear at this point. Uh, the titles are clearly going to spell invitation to kneel before Zod, because if it doesn't, I, I will just be baffled. Um, <laughs> but but we immediate upon having the question answered, we receive a different question. Which Zod? Yep. One? Both? Um, because historically, again, putting someone in the Phantom Zone is just downright awful because you <laughs> you, you usually do it, and then they're there for like an indeterminate amount of thousands of years sometimes, and then they come back or they don't, and they're usually very angry about that whole deal for obvious reasons. Um, and then. The combination is also historic. The combination of people that we have seen is also historically father and son. Um, we'll have to wait to see if if that remains true and how that all works because time and stuff. There's a time <laughs> sphere involved. Because time and stuff. I love it. Because, yeah, like 
wait, it, if he's from the future and then is the present, because like I don't know what the phantom, I don't know what the phantom zone means in terms of timelines. Like, when did Zod go in compared to when did Superboy go in? Yep. And when, how long has he been there? And like, okay. I th- I think the only kind of vague context we have is that Zod was there before Connor. Uh, yeah. Since he's like, I know, I know, I know how this place works kind of thing. Like he has a vibe of, I know what I'm doing. But again, the Phantom Zone explicitly does not have timestamps on it. No, no, I'm just saying, no, we got nothing. All we, Yeah. We, we, even, we have less hyphens and now it says the Phantom Zone. That's the most yeah, we've got. Yeah. yeah. We have a place, uh, but no time, no date. My thought process about it, like, it exists outside of time and space. So I feel like anybody could get there at any point, and you could have people who were all there, who came from different points in their timelines, but were all in the Phantom Zone at the same time, if that makes any sense. But I feel like Superboy has, has been there for the length of time that he has been missing on earth because time clearly passes because the bus showed up at a point that existed, but it exists. I am like making so many assumptions about how time and space work in like a non linear space outside of all concepts of existence but like i'm trying to make a i am trying to make a concept that doesn't make any sense make some sort of sense in my brain uh so i may just be babbling and i apologize but no it is interesting because you have you have three elements that are that are being involved and they all have their own rules and and again my thing with all time travel is as long as you establish rules and follow them you did a great job. That's it. That's <laughs> all I ask of time travel. No, because it's a big ask because sometimes it feels like a lot of media doesn't do that very simple fact, and that's all I'm asking. It could be the it could be the wildest, dumbest things ever to make time travel work, but as long as you follow your own rules, I'm totally on board. But you have magic with Clarion, who was, in our view, you know, going from now backwards through time with like all over backwards and forwards through time seemingly on a singular timeline then you have what was been pre-established with um bart coming back and then it uh, changing the timeline that he came from and so i'm not 100 yes. percent sure what that time travel aspect looks like in the same way that the legion has come back I don't know what that time travel like. Do you have alternate timelines that now exist because of your uh, because of it? And then our third factor is certainly the Phantom Zone exists seemingly out of both time and space so far. So I don't know what's going on. <laughs> That's what we established. Uh, five minutes of us going back and forth very intensely, and what we have gotten to is I don't know what's happening. I don't know. Yes, uh, <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> I, know, I feel it. I feel it very much. Um, what else? What else do you got for your crash in the modes? So again, I watched the trailer um, before this one, and I think I, I kind of go back to the trailer as the arcs happen. Um, so that's kind of why I think I'm bringing the trailer up more because now we're into the fifth arc. So I rewatching the mid the mid season trailer. My thought is that the whole Orion thing, and because of how he appeared when he was less than pleased. Um, that he may be what we hearken back to, um, the line, the spawn of dark side, but I don't know if that's true or how that plays out because you've also, have, I mean, the, vi- there's a lot of visual cues. There's what he's saying to high mother saying that it's, um, what he inherited so on and so forth. So I feel like that that's being laid. Um, is there, and- I feel, okay. There is a thing that just popped into my head. Uh, this may be wrong. This may be something that I have incorrectly heard. But I feel like from somewhere in the past couple of years of occasionally discussing what's up with New Genesis as it pertains to this show, isn't there some sort of plot line from the comics about New Genesis that the like 
Darks, the child of Apocalypse and the child of New Genesis got like swapped, like the essentially like the princes of both planets got like swapped at birth or something for some weird metaphorical metaphysical kind of thing. Uh, and if I'm completely wrong, feel free to cut this. But doesn't I, that you have no idea? I don't know, but I do know that I mean, his, in the comics, Orion is one Google search got me to Orion is the second son of Darkseid. So I don't know. Fair enough. And is that uh, and is the half brother of Graven, who is the one that was talking to Macom. So, uh, but no, that sounds very plausible because I also think like that is that is a good and fun trope to put into your media because i think of like loki you know in in the mcu be actually being from the frost giants so on so forth etc etc okay are you you ready for my final my final mode of crashing sure okay you've seen the images from the tie-in comics yes 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 okay my thought is to clarify for the new set of tie-in comics that are going to be coming out after the end of season four, there's going to be a new set of a six issue, I think, six issue yes. uh, mini series in both digital and print for Young Justice tie in comics called Young Justice Targets that'll be out shortly after the end of the season. Uh, we haven't talked about them on the show yet because we haven't done like an Intel update or anything, but they're coming and we're excited. If you haven't heard the news. <laughs> yep. And essentially, the, like, there will be a, it, it feels like there will be an, an overarching story that is set after the events of season four, as well as filling in some gaps of things that that have previously happened. Yes, that did seem to be the implication of the press release. Yes, um, I think that the things that we see with all the armored armored suits are either the Red Rocket Brigade or the implica- like the implied stuff of like whatever China may have. Because like the, that Superman coming, mentions in the, in in the, the final yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, that's my thought, because they look very similar when I did a little quick comparison. Um, they also like they have the exact same numbering. The suits are super similar, uh, but they're not red as uh, is, is all I got. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. It's going to be a bit before we get the tie in comics, but I'm excited for them. Uh, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think that's all the modes we have to crash right now. Indeed. I'm sure we'll continue to get more every episode till this season ends. But with all of that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And of course, if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend, joining our chats on social media. And of course, you can also support the show by giving us a five-star re- review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., because we have a lot harder time finding those. And if you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.